Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergera.com. Oh, man. We still on? Yeah, there we go. Uh, good morning, Takeover Church. How are we doing? Is Jesus still Lord of your life? So how are you doing this morning? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Oh, man. Uh, I got to tell you, um, I love great worship. Can we give it up for uh, Josh, Al, and Kyle this morning? That was incredible. What I love about Takeover Church is, is we will get thrown a curveball but when we do, we know that's the Lord setting us up. Like no matter what the devil may try and throw at us, technical difficulties, people getting sick, uh, whatever it may be, whatever happenstance or situation comes our way, come Sunday morning, man, we make the devil pay, don't we? We push through, we push on, and we make the most out of this moment because we just gather not around great worship, we don't gather around great coffee, as great as it may be, because I'm a coffee head. We don't gather around a great person or a great message. No, no, no. Friends, we gather around the presence of one in his name is Jesus. Amen? That's what makes this church this church. That's not a slight against anybody else. That just means that our heart and our posture is to say, Father God, come and dwell in your people's midst, and we will respond accordingly. You have every part of us this morning. I'm so grateful for the heart of this church. Are y'all ready to uh, continue with our message series, Game Changer? Yo, Pastor Adrienne brought the house in the heat last week, didn't she? That was great. Come on, somebody. That was amazing. Next week, we got the prophet Zach Kramer preaching. Come on. That's going to be great. Oh, man. It is going to be fantastic. But you know what time it is. The Game Changer Proclamation. So I'm going to say it, and then you repeat after me. Does that sound good? Here we go. He is who he says he is. I am who he says I am. He has what he says he has. I have what he says I have. He can do what he says he can do. I can do what he says I can do. Praise him like you know that's true. Come on. This morning as we continue our series, Game Changer, uh, I'm going to be pretty honest. Um, I, I think this message series has been uh, absolutely stellar so far. I think we're really leaning into the world and our culture and the, and the way things are, specifically in America at this moment. And we're going to keep that trend this morning, but just know that none of this comes from a place of, of lackadaisical or not caring. Everything is so steward here, so thought over, so prayed over, so looked and researched up and down. And we are just so compelled by the heart of God right now for our generation in this season. That while the game has changed out there, it is our heart and our plea that the game would change in here. That Christians wouldn't be riding the bench while the world is riding the bus on to hell. But we would be in the game. Does that sound good? This morning for taking notes from my note takers at my favorite people. Come on, get on my favorite list. Uh, the title of my message this morning is Dress to Kill. Dress to Kill. It's pretty easy to remember. Dress to Kill. This morning we are coming out of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. It'll be up on the Sky Bible if you do not have your own Bible with you this morning. Wow, what a powerful morning we've had so far. I'm so grateful for the presence of Jesus in this place. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, y'all ready? Finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on 
the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take up the salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert. With all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth so boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We're going to pray and we're going to see what God will do. Does that sound good? I got any Christians in the house that are done with prayer, inviting the Holy Spirit in? I got anybody? Anybody in here? Come on, somebody. Father God, right now, we just step aside. We just step aside for you, Father God, not for a man, not for a mandate, not for an order. God, we step aside for you. Because when your glory walks in the room, God, there is nothing that we can do besides bow. There's nothing that we can do besides part like the Red Sea. There's nothing that we can do except stand here and acknowledge and look on and understand that you are the truest thing about us. You are the one that can define us. You are everything for us, God. We will not look to the left or the right this morning. We will not lose focus. We will not become distracted. God, we are an awakened generation. We are a house that exists to see you take over people's lives. And for right now, God, you are taking over the lives in this room, Father. We have no other agenda than to leave here looking more like you, Jesus. So Holy Spirit, come and wreck us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Man, I love a reckoning of the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't care how much I got to cry. I don't care how much I got to give up. I don't care what life looks like for me after a reckoning of the Holy Spirit. I am better because of it. I am changed by it. And man, I am liberated. Does anybody feel liberation in the house this morning? Dressed to kill. Matt, that sounds harsh. The entire Bible is rated R. Just so you know. Just so you know. The Bible Project is a really great way of animating it and making it real cute. Yo, the Bible is rated R, okay? Dress to kill is the least of our problems this morning, so please get ready to be dressed to kill. I love the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is probably, potentially, most likely my favorite book of the Bible, right next to Colossians and Romans and Genesis and 2 Kings. You know what? I think, I think perhaps I just, I just really love the Bible. I'm probably, I'm probably a big fan of all of them, to be honest with you. But Ephesians, for me, man, it is that place that I just return to in my personal time. When I am not preparing to study, when I'm not, when I'm not writing a message, when I'm not going through, you know, a course or whatever. Like, Ephesians is just that book that I return to because there is so much history in it. You see, friends, you and I, one of the things that we desperately in, gen uh, what are we, millennial, Generation Z, this time, this era that we live in, that we have been gifted. Friends, I want you to know, I want your heart to be with such a conviction this morning that when you leave here, you understand the honor and privilege that you have to be alive today. There is not a glory day for you of, man, I wish I could have been a part of the 1950s revivals. I wish I could have been a part of Azusa Street. I wish I could have been a part of whatever year. There, there is none of that for you. God assigned you for this day, this hour, this moment. It is an honor. It is a privilege to live and serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus, in this hour. You need to know that because when you know it's an honor and when you know it's a privilege, you will move and you will act and you will you will go out there and you will live in such a way that you know you're privileged to be here. What an assignment. Daunting as it may be, it ain't too big for you. 
So Ephesians, I love it. There's so much history in this because our generation, we miss this. We miss this. We've been talking about a lot about history in this. And, and we miss it because we think for whatever reason that in 1776 when America was made, established, became a country, so on to itself, we have this in our head. I don't get it. I have no idea where this bloody came from. But for whatever reason, maybe it's an assumption, maybe we're unaware, maybe we're lazy and we haven't looked it up for ourselves, maybe we haven't actually cracked open the Bible in a long time, I don't know. But for whatever reason, we live in such a time where we've been so led and so deceived and so misled that we think the Bible began, it was conceived and written by white dudes on northern America in 1776. And I am flabbergasted by that. Because for years, I'm talking like 1,500 years, even longer before that. But when we start, first started collecting pieces and putting them together underneath the, 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 the uh, order of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't even in English. It was in Aramaic, and it was in Hebrew, and it was in Greek. Like, 250 years before America was even established, the first translation was in English in 1525. But for whatever reason, because it's good, because we live in such a deconstruction time, because we live in such a place where we want to create so much division within our country and within our society and with the nation right now, that we're going, no, that's antiquated, it's offensive, and it hurts people, and worst, it was written by privileged white dudes. The only thing that was correct in that statement was that it was offensive, and that's because, again, if the word of God isn't offending you, you're Jesus, which you're not, and I am certainly not, and I need God to come and meet me when I open up the word and offend me. As your lead pastor, I welcome it. Jesus, whatever is in me that does not look or sound like you, slap me. Come, rid me of myself. I want nothing but you. You see, because this is really important, the church needs to understand what she is a part of. You are the bride, you are the body of Christ. And if you do not understand that this goes beyond our short 200 years as a country, you are going to miss out on the deep history that you have been sown into, you have been grafted into, you have been married into this family tree of God. And in that comes power, in that comes purpose, in that comes the ability and the courage. Where is the courageous church? I can tell you where she was. She was in 1525. In 1525, you see, contrary to popular uh, declarations right now on amazing uh, three-letter news networks. Okay, God bless them. The Bible wasn't written uh, by a bunch of white dudes. It was actually translated from Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew by a bunch of people who don't look like me, okay? By one guy, an Englishman, named William Tyndale. William Tyndale is the man. Yes, he happened to be white, but friends, when he translated the Bible into English in 1525, think about that. 1525, 250 years before this was even a country. In 1525, when he did that, William Tyndale, he was fluent in seven different languages. Now, someone's going to hear that and they go, privilege! Calm down. The reason he studied so hard, the reason William Tyndale learned to be fluent in seven different languages, friends, was not to oppress women, was not to oppress anybody of a certain color or race. It was actually to liberate all people so that you and I, the common man, that we could open up the word of God and we wouldn't have to rely on the elite. 
We wouldn't have to rely on the educated. We wouldn't have to rely on people who chose what to speak, when to speak, how to speak, and what to speak about based off their own selfish motives or desires or hopefully uh, being underneath the influence of the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't have to wait for the educated who knew Aramaic and uh, Greek and Hebrew. Instead, every man, every woman, every person could open up the Bible and read about the relationship they can have with their father. What's possible through a relationship with God, amen? What can take place when you are filled with the Holy Spirit? In 1525, that was the heart behind English translations, and he translated four different times, William Tyndale. But that's the thing that our society doesn't want to tell you today. It had nothing to do with oppression. It had everything to do with liberation, which is the heart of the church from day one. And what did William Tyndale get for his efforts? See, friends, this is, this is what you and I are a part of. This should build courage in you today because William Tyndale in 1525 made the first English translation of the Bible. And what did he get for that? king of England, Henry, he captured him, imprisoned him, strung him up on a stake in the middle of the city, proceeded to strangle him on that stake, and then burn him for all to see, simply because he chose to follow God's call on his life. And translate the Bible so that all could know their father. He was strung up, strangled, and set ablaze for the call of God on his life. And do you know what happened? Henry asked him, William, do you have any last words? Gave him his last right, his last moment to say what he needed to say. And William Tyndale, full well knowing what was about to happen to him, his final words were, God, kid you not, God, open the eyes of the king of England. His last words weren't, I love you, my wife. They weren't, God, save the queen. They weren't this, that, and the other thing. God, open the eyes of the king of England. Friends, my question for you today is, what are you willing to live for? And what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to live for? And what are you willing to die for? Because those are actually two opposing questions. What are you willing to live for and what are you willing to die for? William Tyndale was willing to live for liberation and die for liberation. But for so many of us Christians today, we don't live for what we're willing to die for. We'll put it on our social media, look real good on our social media. We'll put it on a, we'll put it on a post. We'll wear a t-shirt that says it. We'll have it a bumper sticker. We'll have something about Jesus somewhere posted up in our lives, for our lives, to let everybody know we are a Christian. We are living for Jesus. But would we be willing to die for Jesus? Because you can look at the last 18 months of society And obviously, I am not comparing, hear me, our persecution so far has been very light. I'll get worse, but it's been light. Trying to shut down churches, shutting down grocery stores, shutting down your life, 18 months of it. And in that time, God has been purifying his bride because it has been very clear since day one 
what we have professed to live for, but very clear what we are unwilling to die for. Friends, if comfort decides what we live for, if comfort can decide our belief, if comfort can determine our faith, if comfort and safety can determine our lives and what we are willing to live for and what we are willing to die for, friends, how will kings ever come to know Christ? If comfort determines our faith, how will kings ever come to know Christ? Christianity isn't for the comfortable, it's for the faithful. Christianity isn't for those who seek safety, it's for the dangerous. Christianity isn't for the comfortable, it's for the lethal. Christianity. It's never once been about safety. In fact, it's been about laying your life down daily. Can I say that again? Rewind. It's never been about safety. It's been about laying down your life daily. If we're not willing to live for Jesus, we're certainly not willing to die for Jesus. And if we're not willing to live for and die for Jesus, then how will kings ever come to know Christ? Matt, what are you getting at? What I am getting at is some four years later, four years later, after William Tyndale, did four translations in English of the Bible. King Henry, same guy, strung him up, embarrassed him, tied him naked in town square, strangled him to death, set him on fire. Same king. Comes to know Christ. And at his demand, his command, and his behest, demanded that all four translations of the English Bible be put into print immediately, including his very own translation called the Great Bible. Praise God. Go for it. Friends, this is why, this is why knowing your history and knowing what you are a part of, knowing what you come from is so, so Needed. It is desperately needed. It is the most paramount thing about our faith. The word of God. It's not a great suggestion. This is world history. This is a manual for how to live your life from the one who created you. But in our hubris, we would rather pursue comfort instead of Christ. We would rather pursue safety instead of our Savior. When Jesus, when he died on that cross, his, his intention isn't necessarily that you would go on and live as you, but he beckoned you, come and die. Paul puts it this way. He says, friend, it's no longer you that lives. You're a dead man. It's Christ that now lives through you. Christianity isn't for the comfortable, it's for the faithful. So what does that have to do with dress to kill? What does any of that have to do with Ephesians? You see Ephesians? One of the reasons Ephesians is my favorite book is because of the history in it. You see, Ephesians takes place in Ephesus, which obviously, we have to get the name. And that's in modern-day Turkey. And this is amazing because at this time, Paul is jailed, most likely around Ephesus. But Ephesus, if you, would you allow me to give you a little bit of history lesson? Is that okay this morning? Can we do a little history, church history? You see, Ephesus has been around for about 200 years at this point, give or take. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? And Ephesus really started because for whatever reason, young world, primitive people, I don't know, I, I think it looks more like our world today than it doesn't. Um, but there was this meteor that fell from the sky. And people were like, oh, dang, look at that falling rock. Let's go check it out. And they went and they literally, it's a 
a flying rock that descended from the skies fell on the, uh, the coast of, of what is now known as Turkey. And they ran over and they looked at it and they went, it fell from the sky. Uh, let's call it Diana. Why? It looks like a Diana. All right. You, have you ever met a Diana? No. It's Asia. <laughs> but this, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, it's funny for a Bible nerd. Okay, I get it. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> Your nerd is showing. But what ends up happening is, is because it's on the coast, and because people need to worship something, because we have been created in the image of God, always intended to have a relationship with God, and when the fall of man happened, sin entered the world and separated us from God. We now have this thing intrinsically placed inside us as humans to have a relationship with our Creator, but if we're not going that way through Jesus, again, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son, and when we're not coming through the Son to the Father, we'll attempt to go to the Father via a rock that fell from the sky and call her Diana. And what ends up happening is Ephesus would spend 200 years building a temple around Diana. It's what's known as Diana worship today. And they would spend 200 years. Can you think about that? 200 years. How many generations spent their lives building this temple to this rock? How many people woke up, gave their entire lives, gave their gifts, their calls, their joys, their family, their money to building this temple of a rock named Diana that they would then begin to go and worship? Worse off, they would have priests of Diana. Because that's the world, right? They'd love to copy our church and the way we do things, but they don't actually want to give God any of the credit. Oh, take care of the poor? We'll do that better than you. No. Diana worship begins, and they would have these priests of Diana. But these priests of Diana, you see, they weren't, more, they weren't really priests. They were more like bank tellers. Because what was placed directly behind this rock, Diana, was the Ephesus Bank. And suddenly, because it's on the coast, and because there's a bank in there, now it is the central location for all trade, market, money. You had to now go into Diana's temple, and if you wanted your personal belongings, if you wanted a loan, if you wanted any money, if you wanted the ability to get a trade license... If you wanted to do anything in Ephesus, well, you had to first go and worship Diana. Doesn't that sound real familiar? So before there was Karen, there was Diana. Before there was Kim, there was Diana. Before there was Hillary, there was Diana. Before there was Princess Diana, there was Diana. Derive from that list of women I just named what you will. Just coming up with people that we have worshipped over time. Because isn't that just like human nature to worship the creation of God over God himself? Isn't that just human nature? I mean, we do that, right? We worship the gifts that God gives, but not the gift giver. That's where we get celebrity. We worship the humans that God created over God, and that's where we get politicians, right? We worship sex instead of the sex maker, which is where we get the world that we live in today. I understand that's not going to get many praises right now, but <laughs> bottom line, isn't that just human nature that we would worship the creations of God over God himself? Matt, that sounds crazy. Matt, this all sounds radical. What is your point? My point is, is that when Paul begins to write this letter to Ephesus, he knows the history Paul is writing to Ephesus, and he sees 
the sweetest little baby in the room, Noah. Paul sees, he knows their history for 200 years, people. For 200 years, your family, your people, where you come from, has been built around building this temple, around this God, around this woman, around this rock that doesn't actually have any power, that isn't actually a body, that isn't a real temple, that the only power it has is what you give it, that the only allowance that it has in your life is what you allow. This thing that you have been subjected to has actually made you subjects of it, and you have lived and your people have been cursed for 200 years by greed and by worship of a false idol. Paul saw that. And so he wrote the book of Ephesians. Letter to the budding church at the time. I know that you've been a part of a body before, but this is a real body. This is what it looks like to be a son. This is what it looks like to be a servant. This is what it looks like to be a bride. This is what it looks like to die of yourself. This is what it actually looks like to be a new creation. This is what it looks like to be a temple. A real body. This is how you can live. This is the freedom that you can have. This is the liberation that God actually has for you. Diana can give you nothing. But my Jesus can give you everything. And so everything that he wrote, everything was planned out. Everything has so much significance in this book because he knows and he understands these people who have spent 200 years building the American dream. I mean the Diana dream. Giving everything. And Paul says, no, no, no. My God has a dream of a beautiful bride. In Ephesians 5, he's describing her. We preached about it in the last message series. This is us. You can go back and look at it. But my God has a dream. And she is a beautiful bride, lavished in white, presented pure and blameless. This is a real body. This is a real thing that you can be a part of. This is something that you can actually live for and die for and know that your future is secure, that your past has been redeemed, and that your eternity is secured, and it's going to be in the best possible place because it's in the presence of our Lord. Could you imagine growing up in a culture, in a world, of propaganda, where everything that you did, live, breathe, and woke up for each day was around a rock that fell from the sky. When Paul says, you worship a rock that fell from the sky, but we have got a cornerstone that lived and died, ascended into hell, and then ascended back up into the sky. His name is Jesus. There needs to be a movement in our nation against what I'm going to call the Diana spirit where we get tribalism out the way and we get back to Jesus. Where we get division out the way and we get back to Jesus. Where we get down and we decide that we are going to live for Christ and Christ alone. We're not going to go to tellers. We're not going to go and worship at these other places. We're not going to buy into a Diana spirit that wants to take all of your allegiance that will fail you and leave you empty and dry. It doesn't matter what person you, your face pictures when you hear Diana worship. It needs to be Jesus that has your allegiance. There was no power in Diana. Because there was no power in Diana, there was no real power in Ephesus. But in a budding church that wouldn't bow to Diana, you don't want to trade with me? Fine. We got our own thing going. This is an insurgence. This is an insurrection. I know that's not a fun word in 2021, but it's real. This is a subversive kingdom that will rise up and we will show people that there is a way, there is a truth, and there is a light, and there is something bigger than yourself that is worth living for. There's a true way to worship and a true way to live and a true way to war, and his name is Jesus. 
dressed to kill. You see, is this good for anybody? I love it. I mean, see, Paul starts off. I love Paul. He gives me the license to preach messages like this because I just realized I can come off that way and let you and the Holy Spirit figure it out. Paul starts off and he just says, be sure then to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Pause. Be sure to put on the whole armor of God. That means there is not one piece in this armor that we will begin to explore in just a moment's time that is optional. That is optional. There is zero options here. We don't get to open up our drawers here and decide which version of armor we would like to put on today. What's culturally appropriate? What's less offensive? What's less insensitive? What's a less heavy-handed? Friends, we are called to put on the whole armor of God, if we do not put on the whole armor of God, we will find ourselves not dressed to kill, but dressed to impress. Friends, this is dressed to kill. This is not dressed to impress. You see, here's the deal. God, in the Christian sphere, okay, right here in this room, God isn't impressed with nice. Because that's what press, and dress to impress looks like, right? Dress to impress. I'm going to look nice and I'm going to dress to the nines and impress all of these people and men and women. God doesn't care about you dressing to impress. God cares when a Christian actually wakes up and puts on the whole armor of God. Man, my church clothes! Right? It looks good on the gram, but does it look good to God? See, we live in a time and a place where dressing to impress, that'll get you killed. But dressing to kill, that won't just save your life, but that will save the lives of people around you. You see, Paul, he puts it in there. He says, <laughs> he says, be sure then to put on the whole armor of God. Don't pick and choose. Don't decide based off this, based off that, how you're feeling. How you're feeling doesn't really matter. Because that's not the assignment, to feel. The assignment is to put on. And we live in a time and place where Paul says, so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Do you want to know one of the schemes of the devil right now? The scheme of the devil in the church is that you would dress that you would you would dress in such a way that impresses men? Oh man, I just the armor is just so antiquated. Oh, it's so machismo and manly and misogynistic and you know that was written by gender cis men, so uh, you know it's just so offensive. There's swords, and it's from a primitive time of lesser evolved people. You know, I just want a less offensive Jesus. I just want to have a more inclusive Jesus. I just want a Jesus that, you know what, I can, I can live in such a way that I can reach everybody. That's, that's my goal, Matt, really. As, as a Christian in 2021, I'm trying to live in such a way that I can reach everybody. And it's impressive. It's impressive. The acrobats that people do to make a Bible not read like the Bible. It's impressive the acrobats that we do to dress it up and dress it down to make it not what God said. It's impressive. And you'll get a lot of followers on Instagram. And you'll get a lot of videos on YouTube. But you'll find yourself living a mile wide and an inch deep. Paul says, be sure to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. The, the devil is a schemer. 
He's a schemer. So be sure to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Friends, can I tell you another scheme that we're living in right now? There's another scheme that we're living in where I'm trying to be tactful here. There's a scheme that we're living in. Where we have decided to partner with lies. We decided to partner with lies. You see, the first portion of armor here, Paul says, fasten up the belt of truth. You see, when you're dressing to impress, friends, the belt's the last thing that you put on because it brings the whole outfit together. When you're dressing to impress, the belt's actually the last thing that you put on because it brings the outfit together. But when you're dressing to kill, the belt is actually the first thing that you reach for because it's the belt of truth. Because the belt of truth, when you are falling apart, will hold you together. Matt, what do you mean by falling apart? I mean that in the days and hours and weeks ahead, there will be so many times where you are taking shots, where you are catching L's, where you are taking some lumps, where you are being attacked, where you are being persecuted, where it will be very difficult for you to be a Christian. Read the end of the book. We already know. It's happening now. So when societal pressure, cultural pressure, organizational pressure, institutions, your work, whatever it is, friends, family, when the powers of darkness begin to work against you because you won't just go along with the scheme, the belt of truth will hold you together. But Matt, what's truth? What's truth? Friends, can I tell you? Truth cannot be self-defined. Truth is a reality that is created, that was spoke into motion. Truth is defined by the creator, and that creator being God and God alone. Truth if it's based off a feeling, based off a desire, based off a motivation, based off a bad incident, based off a hard day, based off having a gentle mental, based off world events, based off whatever it may be, a fight that you got in with your boo thing. If truth for you is based off something other than God who is, God who was, and God who will be again, then it's not truth. That's a lie. Friends, we live in a time where the enemy has gotten into the church and he has decided this. He has decided this. He has said, you need to step aside, not stand against. Because what's that scripture say? Paul says, be sure to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. But the church today is trying to tell you, no, step aside for the schemes of the devil. What does that look like? No, no, no. Don't put truth on today. Just, just let people live their lives how they're going to live their lives. Let the chips fall where they may. No, no, no. Just dress to oppress your Christian friends while the world passes by. No, 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 no. Just allow the people in your lives closest to you that you actually have a relationship with, just let them make choices and decisions that will lead them on a quick path to hell and also a whole lot of earthly consequences along the way. Just let it happen, man. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you to say your truth is there, should be their truth? Who are you? I'm sorry. Not. I'm the guy that God said in his word 
to be sure to put on the whole armor of God so that I can stand against, not step aside. I'm going to stand against while my generation, millennials, Gen Z, is living a life and creating a culture that will send them and those after them straight to hell. I'm sorry, I'm not okay with living a life following Jesus where I step aside, not step in front. Friends, we are called to take ground, not leave ground. Friends, Christians, hear my plea today. Put on the whole armor of God. Culture, even in the church, is going to try and tell you. Just let them live their lives. Let them be. But if you got relationship with them, if they're in your sphere of influence, you are there for a purpose and with a mission. And it is to stand against the schemes of the devil. It is never loving to partner with hurt. It is never loving to partner with harm. It is never loving to partner with fear. It is never loving to partner with lies. It is never loving to partner with perversion. It is not loving. You see, the scheme of the devil right now is, church, you just need to have empathy. You just need to have empathy for them. But you see, when they say that, They want empathy to actually mean affirmation, but empathy and affirmation are not the same thing, but that's the scheme of the devil that he's trying to work into the church in this hour. Have empathy, affirm them. What does it matter? No, friends, it matters because that's not what Jesus did. Actually, Zach referenced this earlier, which is the Holy Spirit moving in the service. But man, when Jesus comes up on 5,000 men and their wives and children equaling around like 15,000 people who come to gather to see him preach and to hear this Messiah, who this guy could be, to see miracles. When that moment happens and they break up the loaves and do the miracle, do you know what happened before the miracle? Jesus looks on at 5,000 men, women, and children. He says this, they are sheep without a shepherd. And it was in that moment It was in that moment of recognizing they are a lost sheep and they need a shepherd. The word of God records, and Jesus had empathy for them. So you know what Jesus did? He started a social justice forum. He got a great uh, 501c3 certification, created an amazing nonprofit, had a great logo, and then led a bunch of marches. It was amazing. You should have seen it. Man, it was on Christ News Network, you know, CNN. It was amazing. No. What Jesus did, because of empathy for them, for them being lost, with no guidance, no shepherd, no one was speaking up and pointing them in the direction of holiness. What he did, he had empathy for them. And he performed a miracle, and he met them at their very point of need, which was this. He fed them, and then he preached to them. Scheme of the devil right now in the church is that empathy and affirmation are the same things. But friends, if empathy leads you to sin, it's not empathy, it's sin. If empathy leads you to sin it's not empathy it's not loving it's not caring it is not great admiration it's not even affirmation it is sin which means we are missing the mark by how jesus called us to live so matt what do we do what do we do? Because that's harsh and that's crazy. And just look outside. I mean, listen to, listen to the worship in Diana. Uh, Paul, that's not really what we do in Ephesus. We don't really do that in Ephesus. Can't, haven't, you, haven't you checked the time? Haven't you checked the hour that we're in? It's a little different out here in uh, Turkey, okay? Like, in Ephesus, we don't really roll like that. That's a bit offensive, and that's pretty harsh. And that's what we hear today, right? But haven't you, haven't you, did you know the Bible's pretty old? I mean, it was created in America, but, but it's 200 years old, okay? Like, don't you know that that's pretty harsh, that that is hurt, 
today? Don't you know that these things that your Jesus claims? We love when Jesus, you know, is like taking care of widows and loving the little children, and those things are great. But we don't really care when Jesus said, yeah, I didn't come with peace but a sword. I came to turn mothers against daughters and daughters and fathers against sons, and I came to really separate the wheat from the chaff. Like, that's, we don't, we don't want that Jesus, but we want all this Jesus. Don't you think that's harsh? Matt, how can you be loving towards people but against people? Well, it's quite simple because what Paul says next after, after putting on the whole armor of God so she can stand against the schemes of the devil, he says, our fight, it's not against flesh and blood. Paul lets us know you're not fighting these people. You're not warring against these people. Well, then Matt, how can you say that you're you know, for marriage, but not for this. How can you say you're for this with babies, but you're not for this? How can you stand here and say that you are for these things, but against this? Because this looks a lot like people to me. No, 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 no. I'm a Christian. I've bent the knee. I follow Jesus. I've laid down my life, picked up his cross. No longer I live, that him lives through me. And I'm for the same thing that Jesus was for. People coming alive, but being dead to sin. No, 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 what about Jesus that's all inclusive and, and everyone, we just want to get there together. Everybody's on a journey. Jesus never said anything about a journey. Jesus said, this is death to life. No, no, this is my journey. It's just a part of my story. You're not a part of your story. You're about his story, which conveniently spells history. Think about it. So, Matt, what are we to fight against? We're fighting against sin, not the sinner, the sin. We're fighting against demonic influences. And if you don't think there is, friends, I don't know that we're living the same faith. Because the enemy's preying on you. He's preying on our city. He's preying on our state. He's preying on our nation. He's preying on the world at large, and he is killing Christians all around the world, whether it's spiritually or physically, he is taking people out. And he is just making room for his scheme. To be the culture, to be the atmosphere, to be what this whole thing's actually about. But we're not called to stand aside, we're called to stand against. Friends. real and it's hard and it's difficult and I understand that but Christ never promised easy he promised life and life to the full and a full life will include warfare which is why you need to be dressed to kill and not dressed to impress am I preaching to anybody this morning you see truth Truth is not based on your feelings. That's not what you lace up in. You lace up in what God says about you, what God says about him. The game changer proclamation, that is what we suit up in. That is what we go out in. And that is how we are light to a dark world. Truth. God gave me a word one time. Preach my word and my word alone and worry about the Holy Spirit doing the convicting. God, what if that offends? What if people leave church? Matt, you start a church with $80. If you have $80, you can keep it going. Thanks, God. That's actually a really great word for me. Because that means that I can honor you and honor your word and not live in fear of man, but I can live in servitude towards my God. You see, Paul says next is, I know we're running a bit late. I'm, I'm going to get there. We're going to get there. Worship team, you can make your way back up. I'm going to go quickly in this. Never mind, I got permission. We're good. Worship team, you can still make your way up here if you want to play a little soft, you know. Paul says this. Oh, I love Paul. He says, then put on the breastplate of righteousness. I love this word righteousness because here's the thing about righteousness. Righteousness, have you woke up in 2021 and realized that words just don't mean what they used to or what they actually mean? You know what I mean? 
Like we live in a time and a place where words do not mean this because for us, we hear the word righteousness of 2021 and we think of it negatively because it's been associated so often with, oh, that person's self-righteous. They're so self-righteous. Oh, that person, that's a righteous person. They're trying to be holier than thou. They think they got it all together. They are the most self-righteous, sanctimonious person I have ever met in my life. And suddenly, the more you take the word righteousness, as you put self in front of it, sanctimonious, all of these things that are negative in front of it or around it, suddenly righteousness gets painted in with all these things that are negative and not good, when yet righteousness, very definition, means to be in right standing with. In right standing with. Friends, when Paul says be sure to play, put on the breastplate of righteousness, it means that you are placing on yourself, covering yourself in the right standing, right position with, for you and me as Jesus followers, God. Why is that? We need the righteousness of God to cover us. We need to be in right standing of God to cover us because we're going to find ourselves where we are in the wrong standing with man. The breastplate of righteousness will protect you when you are in the wrong standing with man. You see, here's the crazy thing about the breastplate of righteousness. It protects your heart from being damaged. It protects your lungs from being punctured. It keeps all of your vital organs, the things that you need to believe, the things that you need to have faith, the things that you need to persevere, the things that you need to be able to finish the race set before you, the things that you need to fight the good fight of faith and hear well done, good and faithful servant. The breastplate of righteousness covers all of those vital organs in your both physical and spiritual life. And do you know what I think about when I think about the breastplate of righteousness? You see... We're not righteous because of our own righteousness. How many of you know we couldn't get to right standing if we tried with God? That was impossible. Hence Jesus. But we are now the righteousness of Christ because it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives through me, right? And so what I think of is when Christ was hung up on that cross, Christ was crucified, Jesus laid down his life. Suddenly some jabroni with a spear decides to go and stab him in the chest to make sure he's really dead. Isn't it crazy? I don't know if Paul meant this, but I think God did. That the same place Jesus was punctured was the same place that protects. He was punctured for our righteousness. Now we put on the righteousness to protect us. Isn't that amazing? The same place he was punctured is now the place that his righteousness guards on us, friends. The righteousness of God will protect you, will make sure that your heart can stay strong, your lungs can breathe and not need to be resuscitated, that your kidneys, that your vital organs, that you will be able to take in what is going on in the world, consume what is happening around you, but process it all out because your vital organs of faith have been protected. That's a lie. That's a lie. I'm being fed this. I'm being told this. This is being shoved down my throat. This is a lie, and I know that because I am protected by the righteousness of God. The right standing with God will always put you in the wrong standing of man. But it will protect the most vital parts of your body. Amen? So then what's he say next? Actually, I didn't even look. <laughs> Breastplate righteous. Oh, the shoes of peace. Oh my gosh, I love this one. Put on then the shoes of the gospel that gives you peace. How many of you know it's a lot easier to fight when you have peace? It's a lot easier to be confident in who your God is when you have peace. It's a lot easier to wake up every morning and go, no matter what circumstance or situation I find myself in, no matter what the world looks like, I am sure-footed. Because I'm laced up in peace. 
you see, but it's really specific. Paul is really specific. He says, lace up then in the shoes of the gospel that is the readiness of your peace. I love that. Because that means that false gospels are often laced up in, but they can't give you readiness for peace. You see, friends, today we have got to be sure that the, what we are lacing up in is the real gospel. Because there's a lot of gospels out there right now. You can do acrobats to make it fit any narrative you want to. And you can decide, you know what? I can do Jesus on my own. I don't need community laced up. You know what? I don't really need to do things the way Jesus said to do things. I can have sex with whomever I want, whatever I want, however I'm feeling, laced up. You know what? I can just vote for personalities and not policies and let the chips fall where they may because at the end of the day, he's really offensive on Twitter. Lace up. Matt, are you comparing Republican politics and Democrat politics to the gospel of Jesus? No. I'm comparing policies that keep people healthy, keep babies from being murdered to what God said he wanted to do here in the earth and reconcile all of creation back onto himself. See, friends, for some of you, God wants to use you to change the game in the world. And there is an altitude that God wants you to climb. There is a summit that he has for you to take. There is an avalanche that is coming for you. But as you climb to these new heights with God, he wants you to be so sure-footed in his word and in who he says that he is, that no matter what avalanche, no matter what altitude, no matter how thin the air gets, no matter the rarefied air that you find yourself breathing, though none go with you, Christ is still worth following. When you find yourself in that place, you are laced up and the proper footwear to run the race that has been set ahead of you. It is muddy out here, and it is hard to walk in, but when you are laced up in the gospel of peace, it doesn't matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter how thick it may get, it doesn't matter how dirty you might get while doing it, you are sure-footed. He is who he says he is, and I am who he says I am, amen? So what's he say next? We're moving, we're moving. Oh yeah, the shield of faith. I love the shield of faith because a lot of Christians today, we think about the shield of faith, we think about some Roman movie that we've seen, we think about this tin little bing, 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 bing guy, we think about these things, or we think about the most notable shield today, Captain America. Who doesn't love Steve Rogers? Or, well, I guess Sam Wilson now. Anyways, it's all good. Captain America rules. But that's actually not what the shield of faith looks like. You see Paul talking to the Ephesians. The shield of faith would actually be a leather shield. A lot of people don't know that because we don't know our history. But it's a leather shield. And this thing, this thing was five foot, five foot and a half, six foot. This thing was huge. It was huge and it was leather and it was heavy. It was heavy because it was drenched it was drenched in water. It was so porous that you were going out to the battlefield in this leather-soaked, heavy shield. It's tall. It's big. It weighs so much. And why, you might ask? Because it's there to extinguish the fiery arrows of the devil, our word says. And Paul is saying it's the same thing that we would use to extinguish the firing darts that were placed on you. It is so big and it is so saturated by water for the man and for the Christian by the word of God that we can lay down underneath this shield. We can catch all of the arrows, trust that our shield of faith will extinguish them because we are soaked in what God says about us. That then we stand up and we march on and we take ground. Once they've emptied out their arsenal on you. But you see, that shield of faith is heavy, isn't it? 
Man, their arrows are so hard hitting and they're fiery and there's so many of them. And man, they're loud. They are chanting so loud and the lies on Twitter and the lies on this. And man, I am just hearing it from all sides and I'm being taught this in school. My college campus is being told this. And I am getting it on all sides. Friends, how about you just lay down under the shield of your faith? And you let Jesus extinguish those fiery arrows. You're so tired because you think you have to march forward taking these shots. No, lay down, lay underneath, let the arrows fly into your shield that he has prepared for you. And when all the fire has ceased, you then pick up and you take ground. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. The shield of faith is defensive. So what's he say next? He says, put on the helmet of salvation. I love that. Because the helmet in that time was both ceremonial as in practical. No, ceremonial and practical, you see. Ceremonial because there would be a feather, there would be something on the helmet that had some insignia, some scribe, some color, some reference to whom you belong to. And whom you belong to, let your, your enemy know what you are actually for and what you are against. It was basically to let you know, here are the rules, here's what we're fighting for, here's what you're fighting for, now let's go. It would be a marker of whose you are and why you were fighting. But that's not the part I want to single in on. Because salvation, obviously, comes from Christ and Christ alone. Amen. But it's practical because the helmet for the Christian, it determines what you allow into your mind. You see, for Paul, he wrote Romans as well. He spoke and led the Roman church, and he was convicted of renewing your mind to transform your life. That was his whole goal with Rome. Renew your mind to transform your life. And this helmet of salvation, we got a lot of Christians out here with a Christian lookbook when we need to start having a Christian outlook. We got a Christian lookbook. It looked good, but the world doesn't need another Christian lookbook. The world needs our Christian outlook. And that helmet of salvation, that determines how you would see the world. It determines how you saw the fight. It determined how you saw your enemy. It determined, you see, it obscured what you didn't need to hear. It let in what you needed to see. And it protected your head and your mind from any incoming damage it might take. Salvation for the Christian should be your helmet. It should determine what you listen to and what you don't listen to. It should determine what you allow to come into your mind through your ears and your eyes and what you don't allow to come into your mind through your ears and your eyes and take solace in the fact that when you do that, man, your salvation will actually begin to protect your mind. Those struggles that you have with depression, because it's hard to look at the world right now and how people are living lives and the crazy things that we're seeing. It's hard to live that way. But when salvation is your helmet, it begins to protect your mind from depression, from anxiety, from getting anxious because you are fixated on your mission, your battlefield, your race, and what God has set before you. Amen. Last two. Helmet of salvation right here. And the sword of the spirit. You see a lot of Christians. We think the spirit is a long sword made for defense. This is a short sword. Paul is writing about a short sword. It means it's made for close hand-to-hand combat. It's not a defensive measure to get away, friends. 
The armor of God has no backplate. We don't retreat, we don't run away, and we don't back down, and we don't step aside. Amen? We march forward. So the sword of the Spirit, it's a short sword that is made for offense, not defense. This isn't Defense Against the Dark Arts 101. This is for when you are taking ground in your workplace, in your home, in your family, in your generation against people who have alcoholism in their lives, suicide in their lives, whatever addiction it may be. And you get up close and you speak what the Spirit leads you to speak to them and for them and towards them and against their sin and against their struggle and against their brokenness. This is a short sword for close hand-to-hand combat. But a lot of Christians, we lay that down because we'd rather live life on the defense. And we'd rather look active than actually live active. And then Paul says, finally, there's more, but for the sake of time. If you guys would just stand to your feet for me. Paul says, finally, praying at all times in the Spirit. You see, I love those two together, the sword of the Spirit and praying at all times in the Spirit. You see, friends, a lot of Christians, we live lives on the defense with a long sword, not a short sword, because we wait to be in need to start praying. Friends, the time to stand on Ephesians 3.20, my God is able to do exceedingly above all I can ask, dream, or imagine. The wrong time to stand on that scripture is when you're in need and have lack. You want to know why? Because of course God can do exceedingly above your lack or your need or your deficit that you're experiencing. That's light work. You know where God wants you to start praying Ephesians 3.20? When you have surplus when you're already living in the valley of more than enough, when you've got more going for you than you have coming against you, when you are on the mountaintop, God wants to do exceedingly above all that you can ask, dream, or imagine. We treat the word of God like it's bail money. And then we wonder why we're living in a prison camp. The sword of the word of God is an offensive weapon. You can use it for defense if you need to, but it's always to take ground, amen? So then he says, praying at all times in the spirit. How many of you know it's a lot easier to beat an opponent when you have their playbook? It's a lot easier to beat an opponent when you have their playbook. Praying at all times in the spirit, you see, God has gone before you. God has gone beside you. God lives above you. God is now within you via the Holy Spirit. And this isn't so much about tongues, which tongues is a big part of it, but this is actually just about praying and talking to God because he is able to see in a fight what you are unable to see in a fight. When you got mud in your eye, when cannons are going off, when media is loud, when the battlefield is dark, when you are injured, when you take an L, the Holy Spirit in every moment of your fight is speaking to you. But are you listening? He says, pray always in the spirit. Why? Because the devil, man, God knows him. God's had his number. So whatever enemy you're up against, God already, shoot, he don't need defense. He already knows how to beat him. But here we are, we get tangled up in confusion and chaos. Jesus is speaking to his church in this hour. Why are you confused? Why aren't you talking to me? What are you, what do you have to be confused about? I laid it out, but if you need to double check my work, talk to me. Are you disoriented from battle? Are you disenfranchised with Christianity? Is the fight pretty hard for you? Well, come to me, all who are heavy uh, burdened and, and need rest. Like, come to me and I will give you Rest. Friends, 
the most essential part of being dressed to kill is making sure that in every moment of the fight, every moment in your race, that you are talking to God. Because God is always speaking to you. I just feel like he's not speaking to me right now. Yeah, what's your battle look like? What's been going through your mind? What have you allowed through that helmet of yours? What have you been taking in? Whom have you been listening to? Who have you been dating? Who are the most notable, prominent voices in your life? Who's actually leading you? When was the last time you cut out those contrary to the word of God and you just let him speak to you? So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go back into a brief moment of worship. Just brief. Just brief. Worship team, you can start singing right now. And, and really what I want to do is this. I want us to, you don't got to close your eyes, you don't got to bow your heads. What I want you to do is just start talking to God. Just tell him. Some of you, you have got war wounds that have not been checked in a minute. Some of you have got things that you have bandaged up with alcohol, that you have bandaged up with suicidal thoughts, that you have bandaged up up with self-deprecation. You have begun to just nurse yourself, and God is saying to you today, you are dressed to impress, but I need you dressed to kill. So let me change out your bandages. Let me put ice on your wounds. Let me clean your heart. Let me breathe life into your lungs again. Let me clothe you in my power and in my purpose, in my armor. Let me wrap myself around you and love on you again. It's been a hard road. It's gotten difficult. And God's heart is that you would arrive one day at the end of your life and you would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not good and relevant servant. Not good and bruised servant. Not good and taken advantage of servant. Or however you may be feeling led or you may be feeling in your heart. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's the goal. That's the call. That's the mission. And right now, God is inviting you from the young to the old. Let me bring new wine out of you. Let me love you. And let me put you back in fighting conditions again. In the crushing. Jesus name. In the pressing.